<laughs> Brother Shabir, Shukran, it was very enlightening to, to listen to you. Uh, you've said, and I just want to ask, uh, because we're talking about atheists talking to me, and I have some very valid arguments now to put to the atheists. And you've said that maybe God allows pain and suffering, that you suffer here, and then in the hereafter, you have a wonderful time. Now, my atheist friend asked me, but what proof do you have that there is a life beyond this life? Thank you. Well, we should address that question from two angles. First of all, we should ask the atheist, what is the atheist answer to all of this suffering happening in the world? See? Okay, there's a suffering. A tsunami occurs. So what do we do? Okay, this is bad. It's terrible. The believer is looking at it. The atheist is looking at it. Okay, so start with the atheist. Okay, so what's your answer to all of this? He doesn't know what is, why it's happening. We're part of a blind system that coughed us up into a, in a big bang some 14 billion years ago, and eventually will swallow up us again in, in, swallow us up again in, in a big crunch sometime in the future. So we're just part of a blind system that we cannot control. We're just victims of the system. That, that's the reality. And the suffering is happening and there's nothing really, we might be able to make some changes here and there, but this is all beyond our control and beyond anyone's control. It's just some cruel system uh, that has, in a way, created us. On the other hand, uh, the believer looks at it and says, okay, the suffering is there, it's real and it's bad, it's terrible, we feel for the suffering of the victims and so on. But there are ways of, of viewing that occasion uh, that gives us a sense of comfort, a sense of well-being, a, a sense that there is a creator who is, after all, loving and kind, and he has everything in his control. It may look bad now, but he has a good plan for the future. People may suffer now, but they'll get a reward in the life hereafter. Now, all of this is comforting, and I'm not saying invent the idea of God because it will feel so good to have the idea of God, but I'm saying that the idea of God now, in fact, does have some benefits. Whereas, on the other hand, the idea that there is no God doesn't really help anyone in any way. You're still left with the suffering. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, on, on the other hand, when we think about the life hereafter, there are good reasons for believing that uh, there is a life hereafter. Immanuel Kant spoke about what he called the categorical imperative. In the sense, similar to what we spoke, what, what we spoke about uh, under the heading, the moral uh, argument for the existence of God. Well, Immanuel Kant says that uh, we have a sense that we should do certain things because uh, th that is the right thing to do. But if we look at the cause and effect and, and if we look at cost-benefit uh, analysis, some of the things that we think we ought to do uh, do not make sense on that sort of analysis. It may, you may say, okay, I ought to do this thing. This is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. But somebody may point out to you, brother, if you do that thing, you're going to lose in this way and that way and that way. And you say, no, I'm going to do it because that's the right thing to do. doesn't matter what I lose. I just have to do this. So you're responding to what Immanuel Kant refers to as the categorical imperative. This is what you should do regardless. But he says that that categorical imperative only makes sense on the view that there is a life hereafter. Because it means that your actions are not fully explainable given the constraints of this world. The cost-benefit analysis ultimately it does not end here, but it extends into the life hereafter. A person may think he can murder and get away with it, but the ultimate cost-benefit analysis says that he's going to pay for this in the life hereafter. So the categorical, the categorical imperative is that he should not do that. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because there is a life hereafter in which uh, it really it will, will um, be manifest that uh, this is not uh, the right thing to do. So our very actions, uh, whether we are believers or atheists, seem to subscribe to this very kind of, uh, of situation where it seems to be taken for granted that there is an evening of the score that will occur in a life to come. Uh, and of course, apart from that, uh, we do have the Quran which assures us that people will be resurrected from, from the dead. They think that they will be left alone and they will not be resurrected. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assures them that uh, in fact we will all be resurrected, brought back uh, to life even after we have uh, uh, disintegrated bodily, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect, it fi uh, resurrect us finally for the judgment. Is it possible that the principle of Darwin's theory, or assume Darwinism, evolution by means of natural selection, can coexist with creationism? What if 
Adam and Eve evolved into what we are today? Of course, everyone, uh, all believers agree that Adam and Eve evolved into what we are today, right? We're all children of Adam and Eve, and obviously there has been some evolution within the human race from Adam and Eve to us now. Uh, we don't know the precise um, measures that they, that they were. Some hadith mentions some spectacular height for Adam alayhi salam, but that just goes to show that uh, even on a very traditional and classical view uh, of Islam, they, uh, there has been some evolution within the human race. They have said that human beings have continued to become uh, shorter in stature o over time. And of course we can see that there's a diversity of races. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that from a man and woman, he has made you into many different nations and tribes that you should know each other. So if you look around at the very many nations and tribes, obviously there have been some evolution and some differentiation uh, between uh, peoples. Uh, so not everyone is an exact copy of our original parents, uh, Adam uh, and, and Eve. Uh, but uh, the, the, the theory of, of natural selection as put forward by Darwin uh, it, it has two elements. One is the element of observing the changes that do occur. And two, it is a naturalistic presupposition which excludes God from the whole picture and, and, and accounts for everything without God. So first, the observation. Yes, we can see that things do evolve and change. But that does not require us to say that things change on their own and that the universe works by itself. As if the, the universe is a big wind-up clock, somebody wound it up and left it to run, and it's just running on its own without any sort of intervention or involvement by whoever wound up this clock in the first place. The universe seems to work, uh, at least as we believe, by the direct supervision and continuous uh, con control uh, of God Almighty. Uh, as if we might think of, uh, let, let's say we think of, uh, of a computer animated uh, a movie. Mm -hmm. Computer animated movie uh, is obviously a series of images uh, generated by computer and usually it is all produced and, and, uh, and put together and you just hit play and the images flow one after another and you get the uh, impression of continuous movement. Uh, but what if the graphic artist is there uh, giving you one frame right after another and he's doing it live in real time. So you see one screen image, and he's working on the next one. And it's entirely up to him what he wants to do with the next one. He's in full control, and he can change whatever he wants. So if our moment now is as it is, before we blink the next eye, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in full control, and he determines what the next moment is going to be. And in real time, he is continuing to evolve and change the universe one moment after another. So that to me is, a, is a, as, as a way of conceiving of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be in full control and he in fact evolves and changes things. So Darwin looked at the common observation that things are changing and he, he used that to speak of natural selection. You should understand what he means by that. He's saying that nature selects what is going to survive in the next generation. As if nature is some person who has this full control. As if nature is God who makes decisions who is going to survive and who is not going to survive. See, this is the way that people have uh, come to speak of things happening without mentioning God. So they say Mother Nature does something. Who is Mother Nature? I'd like to meet her someday. <laughs> So the best way of speaking of this is to say that not that there is natural selection, but that there is divine selection. So think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about the uh, generations gone by whom he have destroyed because they did not listen to his message and he brought another people in their stead. That's evolution. The bad is swept away and a new uh, thing is introduced with the, with the expectation that there will be some good coming out of this. So, so that's evolution, a, a change in, in the composition of uh, living beings on, on the earth. But it's not by natural selection, it's not the earth decided, oh, let me swallow up these guys here. Uh, it's, it's by divine selection. And uh, when we think about things evolu evolving and changing, uh, we, we should uh, understand that everything that we say that Allah does happens through a process. So w when we say, you know, Allah has given me a baby, Thank you, Ya Rab. 
so we know the mechanism by how by by which babies come into the world, uh, but but we don't give credit to the mechanism. We give credit to the one behind everything, the one who controls the universe and evolves it and changes it moment by moment, and who decides what is going to be. That is Allah Azza wa Jal. We apply the mechanism, but our dua is to Him. A farmer plants his seed, but uh, he makes dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for the results. So I drink some water and I say. Bismillah and Alhamdulillah. By saying Alhamdulillah, I give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this water. But that doesn't change the fact that there is a whole process through which that water has come here. So when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, we're not denying that there can be some process behind that uh, that could be discovered and explained by people who want to study this. Uh, but but be, bear in mind that when we discover that process, we shouldn't exclude the processor. Thank you. Um, question I want to know, why is Allah always referred to in the masculine gender, he? And the second issue is that, which I'd assume, question I want to know, is Allah everywhere? Or is the idea of omniscience, is that not pantheistic? Uh, the Quran has been revealed in the Arabic language uh, of the Quraysh. And uh, naturally, that, that language has its own state of affairs at the time when the Quran uh, was revealed. Languages themselves evolve. And uh, languages come with certain cultural constraints. A, a, a word is mentioned that, ha that has certain associations to a person. Uh, so naturally, when things are, are mentioned in the Arabic language, in the Quraysh dialect, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it will have connotations to people. So we can ask now, what is in the mind of Allah Azawajal? We can't really know that. Ta'lamu ma fi nafsi wa la a'lamu ma fi nafsik. This is the, what Isa alayhi salam confessed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what is in my mind, but I don't know what is in your mind. So Isa alayhi salam doesn't know the mind of Allah. We don't know the mind of Allah. So why does he say things in the Quran specifically the way he says it? We can't know all of the details. So why does he mention he in, in, in self-reference? We don't know all of the answers to that. But one uh, aspect of the answer is obviously that uh, at the time of the Quranic revelation, uh, the, the language was such that powerful things are referred to in the male terms, whereas uh, more uh, fine uh, aspects of life and, and so on are referred to by the female uh, gender. So words in Arabic have grammatical gender. Some things are grammatically masculine and some things are grammatically feminine. These are just constraints and, and conventions of the language themselves. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to people in that language at that time and place, naturally he uses terms which will give the people uh, the idea that uh, is desirable to be conveyed here or at least to avoid conveying a, the, a wrong idea at the time. And since it was necessary for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to emphasize his power and majesty, naturally he used the male gender term because that is what would have conveyed the message at that time. And had he used a different term, uh, it might have thrown people into some conf confusion and that might itself have been a barrier to them understanding and accepting something about Allah Azza wa Jal. Can we change the Quran? Obviously not. Uh, should we move away from what the Quran says? No, obviously not because this is uh, where we get our guidance from. Uh, so, uh, so Allah is beyond what we can describe. We describe men and women. So Allah is beyond all, all, of, all of that. So we shouldn't think of Allah as being a male. Uh, much of the modern discussions about the gender of God uh, comes as a, as a response to Christianity because Christianity views God as being a father and he has a son. And now people start asking, okay, why is he not a mother? And why doesn't he have a daughter? Uh, so, uh, and why do we pray our father? Why couldn't we pray our parent? In, instead of our father. So there is a whole discourse that comes out of that uh, particular theology and naturally when people have asked the question there, they say, oh, let's ask the question over here as well. But uh, you can see that th this is not the problem. The problem is in another direction and uh, the Quran really is a solution uh, to some of these problems.
where is Allah? Uh, the proper way for Muslims to speak of Allah is uh, as already mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, in the Quran and Surah Tabarak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are you not afraid of the one man fi sama the one who is in the sky, lest he sends you an earthquake? Uh, so the, here the Quran speaks of Allah as being fi sama in the sky. Um, of course, what is meant precisely by sama here is not entirely clear, uh, but at least it is a way of speaking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we raise uh, our hands in dua, we have the conception that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high. Not, not because he's there and not the, in another place, but because that is how we respond to things uh, uh, that are majestic and glorious, and that's how we have a sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exalted and he's... Uh, uh, above us. In a hadith it is related that the Prophet peace be upon him asked uh, a, a, a certain uh, slave girl um, where is Allah and she said fis sama and then the Prophet sallallahu bore witness that she is one of the believers because that means she had the conception that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high above and is obviously not any of the things that we see and deal with here not any of the idols that people worship here on earth. They, they, some Muslims have got accustomed to saying that Allah is here there and everywhere by that they mean that Allah uh, is fully accessible. Wherever you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reach you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help you, He can respond to your dua, He sees what you do, and uh, He's never far away. The Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aqrabu ilayhi min hablil warid, closer to the person than the jugular vein. So Allah is close, and at the same time, we say that He is fissama. The fact that we Muslims, when confirming our faith, that's a shahada, we begin by negation. I would assume, la. Is it because of this that the atheist and Christians both have taken two extremes in their concept of the divine? I don't know how the question, um, like how the questioner perceives that this could be like a link, yeah, because we say la, that could be a reason why the Christians and atheists take two extremes. I, I don't know what's in the mind of the questioner here. Uh, but uh, obviously the, the statement, la ilaha illallah, is, it, it does involve a double negative, no God but Allah. Uh, that also has something to do with the Arabic language. In, in English we don't generally speak like this, but in Arabic it is quite common. Uh, it, it, uh, there, there is no teacher like my teacher, uh, and so on. It, so you start with this kind of negative, and it's a very emphatic way of, of speaking. And naturally, the kalima was framed in this emphatic way, given also in the revelation from Allah. We didn't have to invent the kalima, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know that there is no God but Allah. And uh, the phrase, the Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, is also in the Quran. Muhammadur Rasulullah. So we don't have to invent it. It's there in the Quran. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. We have just recognized that these are the most important formulas that declare the co central concepts uh, of our faith. Perhaps the question I has in mind that uh, we, we are making a negation of other faiths. Uh, in, by stating the kalima in this way. Okay, if other people have that sense, then they should ask, uh, uh, well, it, what reason do they have for holding on to the opposite of this? When the Quran says there is no God but Allah, do our Christian friends have any good reason for thinking that this is wrong? No, because their Christian Bible also affirms the same thing. Um, now, what about atheists? Well, it so happens, incidentally, that atheists are, are already saying part of the kalima. Because the kalima, they, they say there is no God, and the kalima says there is no God except Allah. So it looks like we just have to move them a little bit further along. <laughs> In summation, Shabir spoke about the whole idea of belief, and the, the understanding and the acknowledgement of Allah, of God. And certainly that, that places certain responsibilities on us. When we, when we go to masajids and, and, and even Islamic programs, and, and we, we see this uh, quite common when we have um, Muslim guests coming from other parts of the world, um, and, and therefore Shabir's take is quite unique in this, is that people come with the whole idea, Islam has the solutions, or Islam gives you the answers. And, and what I want to leave with, with you tonight is that Islam, or certainly the idea or our understanding of Islam, doesn't provide ready-made solutions to the problems that we see around us. Because if it did, then we would have basically formulated the solutions. But what Islam does do is that it provides a just 
and moral perspective or framework within which we as individuals, as believers, as mu'mins, as people who understand the existence of God in opposition to disbelief, that we take upon ourselves that particular um, principle which can be gathered from our uh, eternal framework, the Quran and the Sunnah, and utilize it, internalize it in formulating solutions to the problems that we see around us. Because when you look at the um, classical Islamic um, literature, the, the classical tafsir, or even the, the, the classical books, the, the hadith, and so on, and you look at concepts like, like ijma, like um, qiyas, like um, uh, concepts like uh, ibadah and khilafa, if you look at a concept like ibadah, which many of us understand to be simply worship or ritualistic worship, but when you begin to unpack it and look at it from the perspective in terms of how the original Islamic scholars understand it, we see that even a concept like ibadah simply goes beyond the conventional understanding of simply ritualistic worship. What happens, for example, when the believer or the Muslim leaves his house and he goes to the masajid and on the way he basically sees a community like Kailicha or like Mitchell's Plain or like Soweto or Alexandra or in Durban like Clermont and Kwamashu and he sees around him a society which is engulfed in, in oppression, a society which is engulfed, engulfed in, in poverty, pollution and so on. Exploitation, exploitation by the religious leaders, exploitation by the political leadership, exploitation by society, capitalism run rampant, and he simply leaves his house, he sees everything that is around him in society, he goes to the masajid, he attends a Jummah prayer, and he goes back home and he does nothing. He does nothing about what he sees in society. Because part of the spiritual quest in Islam is to concern oneself with regards to the environment. Part of the spiritual quest in Islam is to confront the injustices that are affecting us and affecting society on a global basis. If we are to internalize these concepts of ibadah and of ijma and of qiyas and these particular ideals which are so intrinsic to the um, universal paradigm, which is Islam, because our faith is not limited, it's not insular, even the term Muslim. Ask the class, ask the Mufassirin, if he really knows the Quran, is the term Muslim, when the Sahaba heard the term Muslim, did they understand it in the um, historically circumscribed sense as we understand it today as a label, or did they understand it in the universal sense in which it was meant to be purported or meant to be understood? You open up Surah 49 verse 13. Not Ya you are Muslim or Ya you are Mu'min. Ya you nurse or humanity or people. We created you from a single pair, made you into nations and tribes that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other. The most exalted of you is he who is most righteous in conduct. So perhaps we need a new paradigm shift in terms of where we are heading, in terms of where our religious leaders are heading. And I'd like to leave you with a quotation by one of my favorite writers, and then of course I'll hand up uh, the uh, platform to our Imam. And he says here, and I'll read this, he says, ordinary Muslims around the world who have concerns, questions, and considerable moral dilemmas about the current state of affairs of Islam must reclaim the basic concepts of Islam and reframe them in a broader context. He says, Ijma must mean consensus of all citizens leading to participatory and accountable governance. Jihad must be understood in its complete spiritual meaning as a struggle for peace and justice as a lived reality. It may look bad now, but he has a good plan for the future. People may suffer now, but they'll get a reward in the life hereafter. Now, all of this is comforting, and I'm not saying invent the idea of God because it will feel so good to have the idea of God, but I'm saying that the idea of God now, in fact, does have some benefits. Whereas, on the other hand, the idea that there is no God doesn't really help anyone in any way. You're still left with the suffering. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, on, on the other hand, when we think about the life hereafter, there are good reasons for believing that uh, there is a life hereafter. Immanuel Kant spoke about what he called the categorical imperative. In the sense... <laughs> Brother Shabir, Shukran, it was very enlightening to, to listen to you. Uh, you've said, and I just want to ask, uh, because we're talking about atheists talking to me, and I have some very valid arguments now to put to the atheists. 
And you've said that maybe God allows pain and suffering, that you suffer here and then in the hereafter you have a wonderful time. Now my atheist friend asked me, but what proof do you have that there is a life beyond this life? Thank you. Well, we should address that question from two angles. First of all, we should ask the atheist, what is the atheist answer to all of this suffering happening in the world? See, okay, there's a suffering. A tsunami occurs. So what do we do? Okay, this is bad. It's terrible. The believer is looking at it. The atheist is looking at it. Okay, so start with the atheist. Okay, so what's your answer to all of this? He doesn't know what is, why it's happening. We're part of a blind system that coughed us up into a, in a big bang some 14 billion years ago, and eventually will swallow up us again in, in swallow us up again in, in a big crunch sometime in the future. So we're just part of a blind system that we cannot control. We are just victims of the system. That that's the reality. And the suffering is happening, and there's nothing really. We might be able to make some changes here and there, but this is all beyond our control and beyond anyone's control. It's just some cruel system uh, that has, in a way, created us. On the other hand, uh, the believer looks at it and says, okay, the suffering is there, it's real and it's bad, it's terrible. We feel for the suffering of the victims and so on. But there are ways of, of viewing that occasion uh, that gives us a sense of comfort, a sense of well-being, a, a sense that there is a creator who is, after all, loving and kind, and he has everything in his control, similar to what we spoke, what, what we spoke about uh, under the heading, the moral uh, argument for the existence of God. Well, Immanuel Kant says that uh, we have a sense that we should do certain things because uh, that is the right thing to do. But if we look at the cause and effect, and, and if we look at cost-benefit uh, analysis, some of the things that we think we ought to do uh, do not make sense on that sort of analysis. It may, you may say, okay, I ought to do this thing. This is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. But somebody may point out to you, brother, if you do that thing, you're going to lose in this way and that way and that way.